Welcome everyone. This is Introduction to Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. My name is Leo Taylor. I'm a program manager for faculty and staff affairs in the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for the College of Food, Agricultural, and Environmental Sciences. In this role, I provide professional development, workshops, training programs, uh, webinars, and so forth on relevant diversity, equity, and inclusion topics to the college. So I'll do in-house trainings for, for units within CFAES. But then um, I also offer monthly programs that I open up to anyone in the university. I've also noticed that somehow folks outside of OSU have been finding out about the programs and so far that hasn't been a problem. So we might have a few people from the community with us today and that's okay, you're welcome here as well. So uh, this is a very basic introduction to some of the main concepts in diversity, equity and inclusion. And it is intended to be a stepping stone to, deep, to, to taking uh, deeper dives into some of these topics. So it's a very broad brush. Uh, we have a ton of information to cover in just an hour. In fact, this is an experiment for me. I've never done uh, this particular session in uh, one hour. So we'll see how it goes. I am recording it because I've had requests for um, people who want to re review it asynchronously. And I also think that it's helpful for some of us who learn differently, uh, who are neurodiverse, to be able to go back to a recording and, and review the content. So uh, you will receive a link for the recording. Now, normally I don't record my sessions because I try to create a brave space for sharing. Because when we're talking about issues such as implicit bias, prejudice, discrimination, my urge to, um, when, when teaching is to share, to share openly, to model how we should be thinking about these topics. And those can put us in a very vulnerable position, especially if we're being honest about the biases that we know that we hold. So I typically don't record, but I'm recording for, for today because it is such a short session and um, it'll be a valuable resource for folks later on. Even though it's a short session, it may evoke feelings of discomfort. And that's okay, I'm asking that you, you accept that and, and welcome it because as I'll talk about in a minute, that's actually a good sign. And it's intended to be just the beginning. Now, for some of you, this may not be the first DEI training you've attended. That's great. I hope that you'll learn something new. I may approach something slightly differently from other people. Um, I put my own spin on things a lot of times, so I'm sure you'll get something from being here. Uh, if this is your first session, welcome to the table. We've been waiting for you. It's never too late to join uh, social justice movements, and I think this is a great place to start. I hope that you will continue your journey. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is, is I, I thought very carefully about doing it because there is a risk of doing it in a way that is performative and tokenizing. But because this is an introduction to diversity, equity, and inclusion, I decided to go ahead and include it because I want you to know what it is. And I want you to start thinking about it if you haven't yet. And this is a land acknowledgement. So a land acknowledgement, and I'm gonna read, this is the one that um, the Multicultural Center has put together, is uh, simply this. I would like to acknowledge that the land the Ohio State University occupies, and in parentheses here, I'm gonna say, the Columbus campus okay, um, has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst indigenous peoples, specifically the Shawnee, Miami, Wyandotte, and Delaware nations. I honor and respect the diverse indigenous peoples connected to this territory on which we, quote, gather. Now, why do we do this? I could just say this and they could be words and they could be meaningless. That's what I meant by this could just be performative. Oh, yay, we did this. Who is this land acknowledgement really for? Well, it's most likely non-Indigenous peoples trying to like be like, okay, I did my, my deed, right? That's not what it, it should be. Um, this should be one part of uh, a bigger effort to, um, to uh, make up for the unceded territories that were taken from Indigenous folks. This needs to be one part of Ohio State's plan to support Indigenous students, faculty, and staff. So this is one little piece of the puzzle. And um, I also wanna just explain why we do this. So to recognize the land 
is an expression of gratitude and, appreci and appreciation to those whose territory on which non-natives reside and a way of honoring the indigenous peoples who have been living here and working this land from time immemorial. Land acknowledgements do not exist in a past tense or historical context, and that is key. Colonialism is a current and ongoing process. So non-natives need to be aware, non-natives who are caring about this issue, I should say, and striving for social justice, need to be aware of our present participation in colonialism. And that only, only then can we truly reconcile the harm that's been done. So I encourage you that if this resonates in some way for you, or if this seems curious in some way, to maybe take a, a, a next step and learn a little more about the history of indigenous people's experiences in the United States. And here are two uh, resources that I highly recommend if you want to continue the journey uh, along that line. So Howard Zinn's A People's History of the United States, and then one that's more specific to the uh, indigenous people's history of the United States. Okay, so um, that's a very, very important issue in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And it's, and it's not something that I say lightly at all or want to just do to get out of the way. Um, Please keep this in mind. If this is your first time thinking, okay, yeah, wow. We are a land grant institution at Ohio State, but really it might be more appropriate to call it a land grab institution. So we really need to be thinking about how we frame our understanding of um, many different issues. Okay, a few housekeeping items. Feel free to use the nonverbal communication tools that are available through the reactions at the bottom of your screen. I will keep an eye on chat as well as those uh, particular cues. So if you want to raise your hand because you want to speak up, feel free to do that. Um, as I mentioned, we have a ton of stuff to cover. You will receive a copy of my slide deck. So if you are uh, differently abled or uh, a different learner, neurodiverse in any way, and you need time to go back over the slides or you are visually impaired and you need time to go back <clears throat> and look a little more closely, don't, don't worry about it, don't fret. I will send you the slides along with the recording and you can go back through and review the materials. Please, please, please complete the feedback survey. I'm going to send to you a link at the end of the presentation as well as in the follow-up email. And I'm gonna ask you to consider this not just a task that I'm asking you to do, but consider it a part of your commitment towards social justice. Because when I get feedback from people for my programs, I not only do I read them, but I incorporate what I read uh, and learn into my programs. And what that does is it makes the next time I give that program that much better, that much more effective, and you pay it forward when you give me feedback. So I consider giving feedback about programs a form of activism. So I would greatly appreciate if you would take just a few moments and it could take as little as five minutes to complete my brief survey, but it could have a very powerful impact on, on my programs and the way that they affect other people moving forward. So I thank you in advance for taking that time. I have a couple of things that I'm gonna ask of everyone. Normally I ask for um, more things, but that's when I'm not recording. So for the sake of today's se session, I'm asking that you actively listen and participate when uh, prompted, minimizing those distractions, which can be difficult to do when we're working from home or living at work, whichever way you wanna look at it. But do what you can to minimize those distractions. Put the phone on silent. Did I do that? Yes. Uh, put the email away and, and try not to multitask. Maintain an open mind uh, and listen to that discomfort. I mentioned earlier that some of this might make you uncomfortable, but that discomfort might be a good signal that you're on that learning edge. And it might mean that you need to listen a little more closely. It might mean that you might need to follow up on something. 
Maybe there's some self-reflection that needs to happen later on about that topic. So I encourage you to, when that discomfort pops up, to not shy away from it, to maybe lean into it a little bit or perk those ears up a little bit and listen a little harder. I can't tell you to agree to this, but I'm gonna ask you to do this. I'm gonna ask you to continue your journey in some way, even if it's small, after today's session. And one small way that everyone could follow up after today's session is through deep self-reflection. So I'm going to be presenting some things today that are naturally going to start to make you reflect on your own experiences. I'm actually going to give you some reflection prompts and encourage you to reflect on those after today's session. That is a very important part of this process because we have to start with ourselves before we start working outward with other people within the community. So my ask of you is that you will, we will take a commitment, make, make a commitment to take steps to continue your journey in diversity, equity, and inclusion education or exploration in some way after today's session. And I hope that you'll be inspired to do so. So great. Um, there are three main questions that I want to answer today, among other things, but as an introduction to diversity, equity, and inclusion, I thought it would be apropos to start with what those things are. What is diversity? We hear these words all the time, everywhere nowadays. But what do they really mean? What do they mean generally? And what do they mean to us personally? So we're going to answer these questions uh, in turn. But first, I want to introduce to you this tool, which I think can be useful in giving us a sense of what the community thinks about things. This is called a word cloud. Many of you might be familiar with it. <clears throat> so we're gonna gen generate some word clouds. And what this, how this works is you input words into this word cloud generator and it will compile all those words into how common they are. So the bigger and bolder the word, the more times it has popped up in the answers submitted by people. So when this word cloud was generated, the words cloud, data, visualization, word, and clouds were submitted more than any of the other words. So the relative size tells you how common that word is. So we're going to do this by going to a different website. And what I want you to do is think about the, the words or the short phrases, so it could be two words together, uh, two to three words. Try not to do long sentences because if you look, it's going to include every single thing that people enter into the word cloud. So if we have everybody writing long sentences, our word cloud is gonna get really jumbled. So we wanna try to stick to common words and phrases that we think of when we think of the word diversity. So I have a couple ways that you can do this. You can go to a website, Oh, my cat wants to chime in. Let me pull this link. Or you can use a QR code on your phone. If you have a smartphone, you can point your camera to this QR code. So here in the chat box is a link. <clears throat> here on your screen is a QR code. You can point your phone at this QR code and it'll activate the link and you can go straight to the website on your phone and you will see <clears throat> multiple entry lines for words or phrases. If you use that link, it'll take you right to that page or you can go to menti.com and enter a code. So there are three ways that you can access our word cloud. You can submit multiple times. You should see 10 lines. And I've set it up so that you can submit 10 and then you can submit 10 more if you want. So you, there are unlimited ways, um, or unlimited number of times that you can submit. Again, focus on single words or common short phrases. <clears throat> I don't know how many of you have to shush your cats, but usually that works for um, and then I'm going to click here 
to go to the live results. <clears throat> And we should see it forming. So if it doesn't have to, it, Jennifer, do you see the lines that, that allow you to enter the words? If so, you don't need the code. Great. All right, so what we see is that a lot of people <clears throat> identify uh, diversity with different race, variety. And we can see all the little words are ones that maybe <clears throat> just an individual person have identified. But we're seeing the emerging theme of different variety race But you can also see the, the, the diversity of words that are associated with diversity. I'm appreciative uh, of the fact that race and gender is coming up a lot because uh, what I hope to in um, impress upon you today is that, and what I do in, in uh, my, my hiring webinars is impress upon folks that we often think of race and gender specifically when it comes to diversity, especially when it comes to hiring. But those are just two of dozens of ways that uh, diversity emerges in human populations. Great, thank you. So this gives us an, an old wooden ship, interesting. That's a new one. Just having a closer look. All right, so I see lots of um, social identity groups being named. Wonderful. Okay, so that gives us an idea of what people are thinking about diversity. So let's see. <clears throat> what you think about my definition. So I have that uh, diversity refers to the way people differ with respect to membership in social identity groups, experiences, beliefs, perspectives, skills, et cetera, et cetera. Essentially, any way that we differ socially. And I think of it like a piece of the, like a puzzle, a giant puzzle that includes things like religion, skills, experiences, physical abilities, as, as Laura mentioned out, job level, um, the way we think, and thinking styles is a huge one and is gaining a lot of, uh, of, of exposure with the emergence of neurodiversity. So neurodiversity encompasses things like autism and uh, ADHD, dyslexia, dyscalculia, Tourette syndrome, but it also includes the way brains differ neurochemically in ways that, that cause things like depression and anxiety. So people like myself, who have a, a lifetime of, of battling depression and anxiety bring something different to the table because of our neurodiversity. So it's all these ways that we categorize each other. So some social identity group examples, uh, you know, you're, you're familiar with race and ethnicity, two separate things, often confused. Race are these uh, arbitrary biological features that we've created to categorize people such as skin color and hair type. Ethnicity refers to cultural. So you can be French ethnically and black, or you could be French ethnically and white. So uh, as your race. Um, so culture is there embedded in the ethnicity part, but we often get those two kind of confused. 
gender, sex, sexuality, neurotype. I mentioned neurodiversity. We refer to neurotype as um, neurotypical versus neuroatypical to try to challenge that um, stigmatization of abnormal um, types of people. So we want to we want to move away from talking about things as normal versus abnormal. Uh, yes, Michael. To your question, the slideshow will be made available afterwards. We include things like size and appearance in uh, social identity groups. So not only how big we are, uh, if you're a fat person or call yourself a person of size, but also how many limbs you have. Do you have any physical, physical, physical dysmorphias or visible dysmorphias that creates um, friction moving around in the world that creates opportunities for discrimination? Uh, your ability status, whether that's visible or invisible, location, and then all of these other ones. Um, where you were born, where you grew up, uh, if you're a native or not. Uh, whether you grew up rural in a rural area or an urban area and so forth. So there's something called an identity wheel and there are a variety of versions of them. And they can be really powerful tools when starting your journey in social justice education. Because we have to think about our own identities and where we fit into the matrix of society that puts groups at an advantage and others at disadvantage. We must know where our advantages are and where we have disadvantage. And the only way to do this is through self-reflection, understanding how this system has been set up to advantage some people over the other, and then identifying ourselves within that you know, putting labels on ourselves. Now, labels can be limiting, they can be um, problematic, but they can also be incredibly insightful and helpful. So I encourage you, if you haven't done an exercise like this before, here's a possible next step for you. Go through this identity wheel and determine what identities you hold and start thinking critically about whether those identities give you privilege in society or whether they put you at a disadvantage. I have a program coming up later in this uh, season called Identity, Power and Privilege and it goes into more detail about these issues. So if that's something that kind of perks you up a little bit, consider attending that webinar. And I'll give you information on how to find out about that later on at the end. So we now have kind of an idea of what diversity is, but why is it important? Why is there this huge emphasis on it these days. And this might seem obvious, but sometimes when we're asked obvious questions, it can be difficult to come up with an answer. But I want to give you this kind of compelling st statistic. In 1950, the US population was 90% white. What do you think it is now? Got a variety of answers. Yes, some of you are much closer to the to the mark. And Victor, I do see your comment. Uh, I, I'm not sure that I'm going to have time to address that uh, identity and tribal dynamics. That's getting us a bit off topic, but I do appreciate that question. Right. Okay. Well. Let me throw this in there. Every day, the US population increases by 8,000. 90% of those are people of color. And by people of color, I mean black, indigenous, or other people of color that are just not white, basically anyone who's not white. And this change is happening due to birth and death and immigration. So the majority of people who are immigrating to, the, to this country are people of color. So in 2014, it was the first time in US history that the majority of primary and secondary school children were children of color, meaning Black, Latinx, Asian, or Native American. Now, here's a term you might not have heard. Latinx is a gender neutral form of uh, Latino, Latina. So it's designed to be more inclusive. 
There is controversy within the Latino and Latina community about that word, just a caveat there. Um, and, uh, but it is a more inclusive way to refer to that community. Uh, Melissa, you, uh, I did pull this uh, statistic from Beverly Tatum's 2017 book, uh, uh, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together? And she, her citations are there if you wanna follow up on those. <clears throat> So here we go. Um, here's the anticipated racial profile of the US in 2045. It is predicted that white people will be the minority by then, just under 50%. Now, this is grouping all people of color together. We see that the largest uh, group is Hispanic population at 24.6%. But what this is saying is uh, diversity is important because we live in a diverse country. Okay, thanks, Melissa. So, and we do have some that are uh, unidentified or, or non-Hispanic members of a race. But anyway, the point is we live in a per diverse country and it's really important for the sake of, of pretty much every system in our country that we learn to uh, work together. We figure out how to understand each other. We figure out how to treat each other equitably. So we live in a diverse world. We live in a globalized world and understanding and appreciating diversity is necessary to achieve justice on a small and larger scale. So within our offices and within our countries. People live life differently. We should not pretend as though they have it. So this is addressing that issue of colorblindness. So some of you may have heard someone say, or you may yourself have said, I don't see color. I see people. There's only one race, the human race. Well, it's kind of deceptive in that it seems like that would be a good thing to, to believe, but it's actually harmful in that if we're blind to a person's race, we are then blinded to racism. We can then be blinded to the impact, to the reality of living as the quote, wrong race in a given culture or the race that's most ostracized or oppressed. So we don't wanna be colorblind. We wanna see people for the lives that they've actually lived. If you tell a black person, I don't see you as black, you're negating their whole life's experience as being a black person in a culture that's been dominated by white people, that, that they've experienced disadvantage. So we want to see difference. We don't wanna pretend it doesn't exist. Understanding difference, recognize, so to understand it, we must recognize it. So I'm encouraging you, no matter what you've been told about this idea of colorblindness, throw it away. It's not serving you. See the difference, understand it, celebrate the difference if you can. Some differences are hard to celebrate, but they can make us uh, have a more enriched life and experience and work environment to prevent conflict, conflict and make conflict easier to manage. And believe it or not, difference is economically valuable. When diverse teams understand each other, and there's the caveat, uh, we've got to have that cultural intelligence. Adding a diverse group of people in a room doesn't mean that they're going to automatically be more innovative. They've gotta be able to work together. So we've gotta have diversity with cultural intelligence. And then we can capitalize on that diversity and be more innovative. I include this last because I don't like to think in things uh, think in dollar signs. But the reality is diverse teams have been shown to be more innovative and to be more lucrative. So diverse teams can better meet the needs of their customers. All right, I'm noticing time and I'm getting nervous. So I do wanna move on to our second, our second word cloud of the day is inclusion. So think about inclusion. We talked about diversity. I'm gonna give you the inclusion 
voting link, same thing, single words or phrases. All right, the link is now in the chat box. I'm gonna pull up the live word cloud. What do you think of when you think about inclusion? No one left out. Now, if you see something on the screen and, and it's a phrase and it's something that you thought of, type the same thing in. Remember, what we wanna see are the, the big themes that are popping out. So the more people that put something in, the bigger that word gets. Inclusion, together, belonging, acceptance, welcome, everyone. Respect. Belonging, understanding. Great. Together seems to be uh, the biggest one. Great. Robin says equity. Thank you. <clears throat> I like in inclusion as the next step at the dance. So diversity is being invited to the dance. Inclusion is being invited to dance when you get there. So being asked to dance. You can go to the dance and you can have a diverse party. But if, if some people aren't being asked to dance, then it's not inclusive. So inclusion is involvement and empowerment, that all people are respected, valued, and able to participate fully and have access to the same opportunities. So here is the exclusion. Uh, let's say you're, I, one of my favorite movies when I was a teenager was the Molly Ringwald movies. I don't remember if it was Pretty in Pink where the nerds were at the dance, but all the nerds were against the wall and nobody would dance with them. That's what this first one reminds me of. All the popular kids are in the middle dancing together and the nerds are uh, uh, off at the side. 16 Candles, thanks Jessica. <laughs> uh, 16 Candles, yes. Um, so the colorful blob of, of, of uh, off to the side here are the nerds who won't, nobody will dance with. So we can get the nerds to dance, um, but they're only gonna dance with each other. That's integration. So now everybody's dancing, but we won't have complete inclusion until the nerds are dancing with the popular kids. Until everybody has the same opportunity to dance. Okay, final word cloud. Let me pop this link up here for you. What about equity? So we've covered diversity, we've covered inclusion and now, normally we think of, of these three terms in, uh, in a different order. They often come out as diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I think that's because it would be weird if the acronym was DIE. So, uh, but I'm, I'm rolling this out in a very logical way that uh, diversity, then inclusion, then equity. But yeah, the office of yeah, the office of DIE. But I'm being strategic in how I'm I'm ordering this just to let you know. But I, I think <laughs> I think that uh, 
I, I suspect that's why. I don't know. It's just a suspicion. All right. So folks are thinking equal, fairness, justice, needs met, opportunity, similar opportunity, even playing field, same. Empathy, valued, equal parts, right. Okay, so this is good. I'm seeing, it looks like I mean, equal is probably the top, but justice and fairness is right up there, fair, same. So good, you're, you're thinking along the right line. up my slides here. But there is some confusion sometimes about whether we should be focusing on equality or equity and what's the difference. Because we talk about equal rights and that's fundamental, right? Everybody should have the same basic fundamental human rights. That's equality. But when we're talking about equity, we're talking about something slightly different. So how is equity different from equality? And we're often taught, shouldn't we strive to treat someone equally, everyone equally? And, and maybe that rings that little bell again of, of colorblindness, right? I was raised to treat everybody equally, so I don't see races. And that mentality, as I've pointed out, can be problematic. Okay, so. I want, to, I want you to have a look at this image. And this is a, an artist's representation of reality when it comes to, let's think about generational wealth or access to medical care. So here is a representation of what the reality is, where some people are starting out at a really high advantage way more than they need. And some people are below the ground. Some people have just what they need to be able to see the game, to see over the barrier. So there's some sort of barrier in place and we need some way of being able to uh, uh, overcome it. So in the chat, what would equality look like in this scenario? starting at the same place, same amount of boxes for everyone. Every kid has the same box, yes, correct. So boxes evenly distributed. So we would make sure that each individual had three boxes, for example, or one box. Now, Wanda, hold that thought. And, and look at what Shu uh, Hua just pointed out. Because of height difference, the same number of boxes may not equate justice. And Jasmine, you're getting on to the next step in, in, in uh, and, and Casey, you're on to it too. That would be liberate, liberation. Let's, let's remove the barrier altogether. You got a ways to go with that. But let's take it in step. We've got reality. Let's think about what equality looks like. So equality, and, and you're, you're already getting onto this, would we also have equity if that strategy was applied? Okay, so here is equality. We have three individuals, uh, and each of them have been given one box. This is very, can we all agree, this is equality. Everybody's been treated the same way. Have we achieved equity? No. Why? Because not everyone has equal opportunity. So what would equity look like here in chat? Right, Allie. And Katie, you're getting uh, also another creative solution. Let's just remove the wall. But let's just say we can't do that because there's 
always some sort of structural barrier to, to equity, right? In an ideal world, we want to get rid of the barrier. Um, but you're all, you're all getting right to the point. Exactly. So here is a representation of what equity might look like. So the person in the middle looks like they're having a hard time to see. So let's maybe give them a little more. Person on the right or on the left clearly doesn't need any assistance right now. The person on in the wheelchair clearly needs some different type of solution. So what if we build a box with a ramp so that the person in the wheelchair can get high enough to see the game and we give the, the person in the middle a second box. Now we've achieved equity. We've treated each person according to their individual needs um, and perspectives to give them all equal opportunity. So equality and equity are related, but they're different concepts. And we cannot achieve equity unless we see those differences. So going back again to colorblindness, if we refuse to see the difference, we cannot achieve equity. We wouldn't give out our students, all of our students a handout in 12 point font if we knew that one of our students was legally blind. We would accommodate that student. And we're, we're used to that, right? We're used to thinking about that in terms of classroom accommodations. So we need to expand that thinking into our daily life too. It's okay to notice difference. In fact, it's necessary. Okay, so equity involves fair treatment that allows for equal access, opportunity, and advancement. And it considers the diverse and unique needs of each individual. Equal access does not mean equal treatment. Okay. Just making a note of the time. Uh, I do understand we, this has been marketed to go until two o'clock. It is possible that I will go a little bit over. I understand if you have to leave promptly at two o'clock. I do ask though, if you can stay uh, until two o'clock, please do so. If you can stay longer, wonderful. Uh, but I, I will do my best to get through, to, through the rest of this. I do wanna cover some other basic concepts, prejudice, bias, and discrimination. Prejudice is learned prejudgment about members of social groups. And it can be to ones to which we belong and ones that we don't belong. Um, I'm taking this definition from a, a really good resource that I'm going to show you later uh, and recommend. But the key here is that it's learned. And also everybody has prejudice because we learn it through our socialization process. It leads to simplistic assumptions and associations that we then generalize to an entire group. So we form stereotypes and it forms our biases. But not everyone puts their prejudice into action. Therefore, we don't have to discriminate. Discrimination is when we put our prejudices into action. And it means to treat one person differently based on our preconceived assumptions. So a, an association or a stereotype gets triggered and then we treat them differently based on this learned prejudgment. And this can happen consciously or unconsciously. We make these associations, these mental connections, very, very good at doing this. Uh, we evolved to be very effective at making associations just to survive. Uh, this creates shortcuts to reduce processing time. Our ancestors became really good and identifying certain stimuli to elicit a specific response. I'll give you some examples. Associations are not inherently bad. On the, on the contrary, they're highly adaptive. So if you're allergic to poison ivy or poison oak, and you've had a bad reaction to running into that plant, you learn pretty quickly how to identify a plant that looks like that. And you may avoid all three lead, compound lead plants for the rest of your life, even if they only somewhat resemble those plants. But you've formed that association and it's highly adaptive. And our ancestors learned how to associate life-threatening organisms with death and um, <laughs> what is it, Nikki? Spiders <clears throat> or snakes, uh, red berries with illness, and we learned to avoid them. 
So our brains are hardwired to make split second unconscious decisions about friend or foe or danger. And this is how we can get into trouble with social identity groups, because we form a stereotype based on media representation, let's say um, Muslims, that association gets made, that shortcut gets made in our brain. We see someone who looks Muslim out and about in the world, that gets triggered. And we can have, we can have a physiological response to that. If we have trauma, say from 9-11, for example, so this is where seeing those differences, allowing yourself to see those differences and really slowing down, taking the time to think, okay, I'm having an uncomfortable feeling. Having good emotional vocabulary is very helpful in this process to really pinpoint what you're feeling when you're feeling it. So for example, I was bullied by a, a black girl in middle school one time. She scared the crap out of me. There's a stereotype associated with the black girls in the school that I went to. And it has translated, and this is the part where you, ha you have to be honest with yourself. You have to just, no one wants to admit that they have biases. No one wants to admit uh, they've, they've had these, um, these experiences that lead to some sort of learned prejudgment, that prejudice but you have to be honest with yourself. So this has led to the formation of an, a discomfort that emerges when I am around, yes, thank you, Kimba. When I am around black women who get loud and it clicked one day when I was on the Metro in New York City, when there were three black women la hooting and hollering and laughing and just having a great time with each other. They were not angry. They were not aggressive. They didn't even know I existed but I felt that discomfort. And that, remember, discomfort, maybe listen a little harder, lean in a little bit. That was my cue. Okay, this is really curious. They're having a great time with each other and I'm getting uncomfortable. First of all, this isn't about me. Why am I making it about me? What's going on here? And that, that started that self-reflection process where I could say, you know what? I think this goes back to 1981 or whatever year that was, when Tanya cornered me in the hallway in middle school and scared the crap out of me. And it's associated with this stereotype of black, the angry black woman. And this is how it's impacting me today. That was a really powerful experience. So understanding what stereotypes you're affected by, that you're susceptible to, what is your trauma that you're carrying around that's associated with certain social identity groups? I mean, if you witnessed 9-11, you may very well have trauma associated with that that can affect your perception of, of Muslim Americans or Muslims or anyone who looks Muslim. So this is so incredibly important to be aware of these differences. So understanding stereotypes, these broad, fixed, oversimplified, assumptions that we make about an entire group of people based on social identity group membership. I should point out this is about perceived social identity group membership. It doesn't matter if you're white, if you're half white, if you're three quarters white, if you look black, people will put you in the black category and you will be afforded the, the privileges or the lack thereof wherever you go. Now, you can have different types of privileges wherever you go based on your, your social identity group membership. So um, we simultaneously lack and have privilege. So I don't wanna paint it as a horribly negative thing across the board, but anyway, um, it's all about perception. Yes, thank you, Victor. Self-reflection is such, such an important, critical and powerful part of this process. It can be incredibly insightful. I've had some of the most important insights into my own biases just by connecting the dots from my own personal experiences. So I mentioned stereotypes are activated through association and it can just be that one, that one incident, that one rash from poison ivy created that strong association. 
and they can be both positive and negative. I'll let you look at these positive and negative stereotypes. I have a slide here that shows a variety of, and this is not intended to be inclusive of everyone whatsoever. I have, I have picked images that I know will elicit certain feelings from some people. I have selected images that are directly related to my own biases. For example, um, here's, here's another example of self-reflection. It has bothered me my whole life that I notice people of size as being over, well, overweight, or that's how, and I'll explain why that word comes to mind. Drives me nuts. Uh, I don't, I don't want that to be the first thing that I notice about something, but I also don't like that there is an associated stereotype that comes with that. And there's the stereotype that if you're, if you're a person of size, if you're fat, then you're unhealthy or you have certain behaviors, you do certain things, it's a stereotype. And only through self-reflection have I been able to discover that the root of that bias of, of that thing that pops out right away when I, when I see someone comes from my mother. Comes from my mother and her self-loathing as a person of size, of all of the dieting that she has done, has done her whole life, the, the self-degrading comments that she makes about her size. And most importantly, when I was growing up and we would be going shopping or out and about running errands, if she would see an overweight woman, she would lean in and very discreetly say, oh, she's really heavy. My mother trained me to see that. And it takes a lot of work to undo that, to undo years of conditioning. So what I'm encouraging you to do is, you know, an example through these images, but also just as you're moving through life, start noticing the little messages that might pop up, the little comments, the little thoughts. Are stereotypes triggered? Do you start to create a story about a person? The only way that you can do that is if you notice what you're seeing and you acknowledge it. And thank you, Rana, for, for um, chiming in. It, size, size discrimination is real. And we, we just have to, we have to start getting comfortable with the discomfort of acknowledging our own biases. It, is, it never gets easier for me to talk about my own biases. It never gets easier for me to talk about the discomfort that can get triggered around loud black women. And it never gets easier to talk about this issue uh, with, with seeing people of size. But what it does is it empowers me to not discriminate because I can have that awareness. It's not an implicit bias anymore. It's, it's in my awareness and I can control it. And I'm gonna show you a graph in a minute uh, that will, will illustrate that. So moving forward, reflect for yourself, what stereotypes, the white Barbie, interesting, Nikki, uh, what stereotypes affect you personally? Because those can be a source of trauma. And they can be, they can uh, start our, the formation of biases. More importantly, I think, what stereotypes are you susceptible to? And what I mean by that is, I've shared a couple, but when I see people, I'm susceptible to those stereotypes being triggered. And, and this involves a self-reflection of basically your whole life your most formative years in particular when you were socialized? And how do those stereotypes impact you on a regular basis? And I guarantee if you start to notice these things, 
you start to notice the differences, you start to really notice the people around you, you're gonna notice the stereotypes that pop up. You're gonna start to notice some beliefs that you hold that you might wanna let go of. Speaking of bias, this is not an implicit bias webinar, but I do wanna introduce you to the concept. Bias is simply an affinity toward or a prejudice against a thing, person, or group of people. Um, Kylie, that's an interesting question. Stereotypes, there is a universality to stereotypes. I mean, we can all, if I asked you to um, come up with a particular stereotype, you'd probably come up with similar answers, right? But keep in mind that a stereotype is simply something that we as individuals create and then apply. So I can have a single experience one time in my life that I then use to form a stereotype that I apply to everyone else that kind of fits that description. So in some ways, their beliefs, in some ways, I mean, I, I think, I, I think that, at their core, they would have to be beliefs. The belief that someone is a certain way because they fit a certain description. All right, notice here that bias can be an affinity and not just a prejudice. We often think of bias as being this negative thing. I mean, it is negative, but, um, but yes, yeah, so I understand it's uh, 158. If you, if you all have to, if some of you have to go, please, Please, uh, please do so. Uh, I, I was much more ambitious than um, and, and wanting to get those word clouds in, but the recording will be available for you to catch up on the end. So a bias is what we see, uh, the, the conscious bias is what we see on the surface of this peer, the attitudes, beliefs, stereotypes, and assumptions that we hold about people in social identity groups, including those groups to which we belong. So we form these uh, biases throughout our lifetime and we form biases before we even know who we are. But underneath the surface are all these unconscious biases that affect us in ways that we're not aware of and also come out in unintentional ways. And that's what we call implicit bias. And I have a short clip for you Close out of that. And my sound should be good. Please let me know in chat if there are any, any challenges with the uh, video or the audio. Implicit bias. Implicit bias. Implicit bias. 2016 was the year that implicit bias went somewhat mainstream. Yeah, so when Hillary Clinton mentioned implicit bias in the debates, our phones started blowing up, all our friends started emailing us about it. But what is implicit bias? Implicit biases are basically thought processes that happen without you even knowing it. Little mental shortcuts that hold judgments you might not agree with. And sometimes the shortcuts are based on race. First, some clarity. Saying someone has an implicit bias is different from calling someone a racist. The word racist is a highly loaded term, right, here in American society. A lot of times, when people are using it, they're thinking of the kind of old-fashioned, Ku Klux Klan-style racist. But implicit bias isn't anywhere near that, you know, explicit. Implicit bias is something that comes out of ordinary mental functioning, out of how the mind normally works. We've all grown up in a culture with media images, news images, conversations we heard at home, our education. Think of that as a fog we've been breathing our whole life. We never even realized it, what we were taking in. And that fog causes associations that lead to biases. I somehow know that if you say peanut butter, I'm gonna say jelly. That's an association that's been ingrained in me because throughout my life, peanut butter and jelly are together. And in many forms of media, there is an over-representation of black men and violent crime being paired together. And because of that, 
I actually deep down inside have been taught that black men are violent and aggressive and not to be trusted, that they're criminals, that they're thugs. With all those associations, I'm not trying to let us off the hook, but in some ways, none of us stood a chance. All right, I love this analogy of the fog <clears throat> because it highlights the passive nature of our socialization. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about socialization in a little more depth here in a minute, but just to recap, Implicit bias are the positive or negative uh, attitudes and beliefs we unknowingly hold about people or groups. So explicit bias, on the other hand, would be the biases that we're aware of. Unlike conscious bias, we, we don't know when it operates and it often contradicts conscious beliefs. Okay, this is critical. Um, I identify as an anti-racist, but what I shared with you earlier about my experience with Tanya in middle school and how that has created this discomfort when I'm sometimes, not always, and it's getting better, sometimes around louder black women, that is a racist bias. But I am an anti-racist person working constantly on a daily basis for my career to eradicate racism. So they're directly contradictory. I do not identify as someone who holds racist beliefs, but I have these biases that have racist roots. Okay, implicit bias is automatic, and we attribute these characteristics based on stereotypes that we've either di directly developed because of our personal experiences or because of the stereotypes that have been perpetuated, especially through the media. So black men and violence, very heavily overrepresented in the media. And that, that is a source of stereotypes, powerful source of stereotypes. And we can't control when it operates. Most importantly, everyone has uh, implicit bias. Even members of marginalized populations hold biases about members of their own community. So you saw an African-American man in the video talking about how well deep, because of how I've been um, breathing this fog deep down inside, I've been trained to believe that black men are violent, to be afraid of black men. Um, and people of the LGBT community, for example, hold biases about members of their own um, communities. So uh, everyone is susceptible to developing these biases. I was watching, uh, Peel, oh, it's the comedians. Peel and somebody's gonna get it. Key and Peel, thank you, Jason. Uh, they they did a little skit, uh, and it was the two of them. They're both black men. Uh, one's on his phone, and he's I'm gonna say talking talking very quote white as they would put it. Um, and one of the other guys walks up, black guy. And all of a sudden he changes completely the way he talked, he was talking and he got really like um, tough, like sounding. And the other guy did the same thing. And then one of them walks away and the other one go, says to his wife or whatever says, oh my God, I almost got killed. So it, it's playing on this uh, idea that, that even members of uh, people of color can hold these biases about, about uh, members of their own community and, and expect, you know, expect black men to be violent because that is the message that's been sent over and over and over again. <laughs> Thanks, Nikki. Yeah, they are really, really funny and, and they, they poke fun at themselves um, in a very effective way. Um, so how do we form association stereotypes and biases? I mentioned the cycle of socialization. Uh, we're a blank slate when we're born and immediately inherit a, a society full of rules and a society that has not been built on equity. It's actually working exactly as it was designed. If you remember, when uh, this country was formed, only white men who owned property could vote. So not even all white people had equity when this country was formed. So we are making um, 
major improvements to the system, but keep in mind, it's not a broken system. The system was working just as it was designed. It was designed to benefit some people at the expense of others. And when we're born, we don't have any prejudices, so we acquire them. We don't, have, we don't know anything. So we absorb like a sponge everything that we are, are taught for a certain part of our life. Uh, in our first part of our socialization, those that are closest to us, those who are rearing us, establish how we should think about ourselves and others according to social identities and norms. And we establish our internal sense of where we fit into social identity groups. Some of you might have experimented with certain things. I know I went through a goth phase and dyed my hair black and painted my fingernails black. And like, you know, some of us experimented uh, in high school, others in college, but we figure out where we fit. But also there's a process by which we get placed into social identity groups, an external placement. For example, this is something that I learned mentoring a, a, an Asian a Chinese graduate student at Ohio State. Um, she had always lived in China, but the moment she moved to the US, she had a new social identity uh, that she didn't want to adopt because it didn't resonate with her. She is considered a person of color. Even though, according to her, her skin is as white as any white person. So she had some really interesting questions for me. Why am I considered a person of color when my skin is white? And why isn't white considered a color? So we had some really interesting discussions. Um, so regardless of what her identity is, she is now considered a person of color in this culture. So we are based, uh, we are assigned membership to groups based on perception. I have a friend who is white but who looks, looks Italian, but I thought that she was at least half black for the first year of our friendship. And this is a common thing for her. She frequently gets mistaken for a black woman, even though she's 100% white. She did get her DNA tested and found out she has a really high percentage of Ethiopian DNA. So she's got some, some African roots, but, um, but very fascinating. It really doesn't matter what your true identity is. And, and I have another example to share with you momentarily. Um, it's what people perceive that's most important. So anyway, moving on to the second part of our socialization, and, and this is just as powerful, if not more so, than when we're being reared at home. Every institution that we interact with, especially the media, sends clear messages about who has power, who doesn't have power, what associations and stereotypes you should adopt. And this is the foundation of our prejudice. We learn really, really quickly, even if not at home. Once we get into the school system, we learn what the expectations are for being a boy and being a girl, uh, just through peer, peer pressure and policing. This is a workbook that some a parent, an upset parent, posted on social media a couple of years ago. And I'm posting this here, assuming that the author did not have bad intentions or was, was not aware of what they were doing. I also find it interesting that, you know, it's not just one person that's involved in the publication of these types of materials. So multiple people would have seen it. So this would have gone unnoticed by multiple people. But this is, these, the subtle way that implicit bias can find its way to children in particular, but, but also anyone at any age. So what do you see here with respect to stereotypes or associations? Feel free to chime in via chat. Angry black girl. There's that angry black woman stereotype popping back up. The people of color. So uh, the darker skinned children are associated with the negative feelings. And the white male is proud. Right. It is very stereotypical. It's not only stereotypical um, 
I find with respect to race. But I also find it interesting that of all the children, the, the white male was number one, which is very representative of how our society is structured with respect to privilege. So this is mimicking very much so how it's structured. And these are the messages that children, children in general, but you think looking at these negative messages that the children of color are receiving, they receive these on a daily basis. So um, they're very insidious. It's something as simple as this, very, very insidious. And it's, and it's something that we all need to be uh, watching out for and holding ourselves accountable for. Here's a, a short video I wanna share with you uh, on the power of perception. Is this gonna be enabled? Yes, great. Thank you for staying with me. My sister-in-law, uh, who's half black, half white, but looks white, blue eyes, whiter than most white folks, very white. Uh, she and I, you know, we kind of grew up together. We raised our children together. Uh, so they're first cousins and we, you know, it's the wonderful, very, very multicultural family. So we're going in a safe way one day. And um, Kathleen, my, my sister-in-law is in front of me and she's, uh, you know, writing a check for her groceries. Now my daughter, who at the time was 10 years old, was standing with me and I was directly behind her you know, getting ready to get my groceries. So Kathleen comes up and the checker, who is a strawberry blonde. Um, freckled, very delightful, warm, um, you know, the checker, this young woman is talking to Kathleen. Hey, how you doing? This is a nice day today. They're just chatting up and she says, yeah. So Kathy writes her, her check and she steps off to the side with her groceries because she's waiting for me. Of course, again, Kathleen looks white, right? So I come up. No conversation. She looks up at me. Absolutely no, just a little chatter. And uh, I write my check. My daughter, however, is 10, notices immediately the difference in how she responds to me. So I write my check, and she goes, I'm going to need two pieces of ID. At which point, my daughter looks at me, and she gets very, very embarrassed, and tears are, are, are kind of coming up in her eye like, Mommy, you're not going to... You're not going to let her do this. Why is she doing this to us, right? So I'm trying to figure out what I should do because behind me are two elderly white women, right? And I'm thinking, okay, so then I become the angry black woman, right? And they're going to be, and I just, I'm, I'm just trying to second guess all the drama. So then I, I just give her the two pieces of ID. I said, you know, some things you got to choose your battles, right? And then it gets worse. She pulls out the bad check book, right? So the, the, this is the book that shows the people who have written bad checks. So she starts searching for my license in the bad checks, at which point it's just out of control now. Just as I'm standing there um, trying to decide what to do, and it's really deeply humiliating. Now my, my daughter is in full-blown emotionally upset, who's 10. My sister-in-law walks back over and she steps in and she says, excuse me, why are you doing this? And the checker goes, well, what, what, do you, what do you mean? She goes, why are you taking her through all of these changes? Why are you doing that? She goes, well, um, this is our policy. She goes, no, it's not your policy because you didn't do that with me. Oh, well, I know you, you've been. She goes, no, no, she's been here for years. I've only lived here for three months. And so at this point, the two white elderly ladies go, oh, I can't believe what this checker has done with this woman. It is totally unacceptable. At which point, the manager walks over. So the manager walks over and says, is there a problem here? And then my sister-in-law again responds. She goes, yes, there is a problem here. Here is what happened. So you see, she used her white privilege. And even though Kathleen is half black and half white, she recognizes what that means. And she made the statement. She pointed out the injustice. And she, as a result of that one act, influenced everyone in that space. But what would have happened? I can't know for certain had the black woman said, this is unfair, why are you doing this to me? Would it have had the same impact? But Kathleen knew that she walked through the world differently than I did. And she used her white privilege to educate and make right a situation that was wrong. That's what you can do every single day. So this is where that, that self-reflection of your own identities comes into play and understanding where you fit into what's called the matrix of oppression. 
So if you are a white person, you have white privilege that you can tap into in situations like this. So undoubtedly, if, uh, if the black woman had said something, it would have been perceived differently. Who knows how differently, but it would have been received differently than if the woman who was perceived to be white, even though she's half black, said it. So recognizing your social identities and where you have privilege will enable you to identify areas where you can, now, now you notice in this story, she didn't go in aggressively and you know attack. She very gently pointed out, you know, what's going on here? Why are you doing this? And corrected the cashier's thinking. First of all, what was the first thing that uh, the first way that the check cashier discriminated? Right. Thank you, Eric. The very first thing that she did with it was discriminatory. Now remember, discrimination is just treating people differently, is that she just completely treated Joy differently than her per perceived to be white sister-in-law. No greeting, no chit chat. And, and that's very deeply impactful. Uh, so this cashier held some assumptions, some stereotypes, um, <clears throat> and they were triggered. Uh, and she treated these two sisters differently, but the, 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 white, the white sister, the sister perceived to be white, recognized that she had an opportunity to say something in a way that would be impactful and, and did so. So <clears throat> as you're reflecting moving forward, think about the identities that you hold that are visible and are invisible to other people. And also think about the ones that are not always reliable. So the ones that are uh, have the asterisk are ones that can be highly subjective and highly contextual, and you might get wrong. So race, sex, ability, status. So people can have invisible disabilities. Um, gender can not always be obvious. Class, religion, and so forth. There's only a couple things that are used, that are pretty reliable. But a lot of other things are under the surface and we can't be certain about. But we make our assumptions about the things that we see and we make our decisions about the things that we assume based off of what we see. So I see you have darker skin. I assume that you're a person of color. That triggers certain beliefs, stereotypes, biases, uh, attitudes. So digging deep, thinking about our own identities, I encourage you to uh, go through this process and actually fill out your iceberg. You know, what do people see? Are they accurate? What do people not see? And are some of those things that they don't see really the most important parts of your identity? I'll share a little bit about me, my iceberg. When people see me, they make some specific assumptions and they are correct about I'm only going to cover four um, categories, actually there are two, um, that are the most salient to me, meaning the most important or the most um, relevant at all times. Yes, I am white and yes, I am a man. However, I was born in a female body. So I'm a transgender man who transitioned 20 years ago by taking testosterone. And people assume that I am non-disabled, but I have an invisible, I have a couple of invisible disabilities. But I am granted uh, non-disabled privilege in addition to my white male privilege, even though I am disabled and I am cisgender. I mean, I'm not cisgender, I'm transgender. Sorry about that. So cisgender means your gender identity aligns with your sex assigned at birth. I am transgender, therefore I am not cisgender. But people assume that I'm cisgender because I look like a man, right? So I'm afforded that privilege that goes with being a man in this society. So think as you move forward, in what ways do other people perceive you correctly and incorrectly? In what ways might you perceive other people incorrectly? And what is the impact? 
So you're getting the idea here that I'm a big proponent of self-reflection, but also add to that conversations with other people about their experiences. Try to get to know as many people as you can who are different from you, learn about their experiences, because this together can lead to powerful insights about how we accurately and inaccurately view and unintentionally treat others based on inaccurate perceptions. And I do thank you for sticking with me. I'm almost to the end of this presentation. Here's the graphic I, I referenced earlier. Remember, we, we are so good at making associations. We've, our lives have depended upon it. Maybe your life has depended on making good associations, accurate associations. So there's nothing wrong with having that direct response to that stimulus. Remember Pavlov's dogs, if you remember the classical conditioning psychological experiments. It's how we learned about this. Uh, the dog hears, uh, sees the food, he salivates. You pair the food with the bell, ring the bell eventually, and then all you have to do is ring the bell and the dog will salivate. So we are just like that dog. What we want to do, though, is in certain situations, when our life doesn't depend on it, if we're that cashier in that safe way, is see the stimulus, okay, that person is white. I'm not going to automatically respond based on the biases and beliefs and stereotypes that I hold about white people. I'm going to give myself a little bit of space to apply my conscious conscience, to apply my independent will, to apply my self-awareness so that I have the freedom to choose the appropriate response. So I'll apply this to myself. I see a group of black women that are being rowdy. My response, I get a physiological response. It makes me start to sweat. It makes me anxious, or it just makes me feel a little uncomfortable. So somebody who's not really thinking about their response might do something like leave or treat someone poorly because of it, or be confrontational or do something that would be negative. But if I apply my self-awareness of why I have that response, I then expand that space between stimulus and response and can and can choose how I want to respond. And so in those moments, I can say, oh, this isn't about me. I know exactly what this is. And then let it go. And it doesn't even impact me in that moment anymore. And it doesn't impact the way I treat other people. And that's really what we want, right? When we're talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, we just, we're trying to not discriminate. And I guess that's what it really boils down to. We wanna treat everyone equitably. And that's what that space allows us to do, is to apply a lens of equity. So making, uh, moving forward, making changes, learn about common ways by and bias manifests, continue your education. I hope that something that's come up today has inspired you to wanna take a next step in uh, maybe a deeper dive in a particular topic, or just continue self-reflection examining your socialization. I mean, that's a, a pretty pretty heavy process, just really diving deep into your own learning process, what you've learned over your life. And remember, our socialization continues throughout our lifetime. Um, think about the experiences that you've had with various people in certain social identity groups, including ones that you belong to. Uncover those messages that you received that you want to let go of. Because a lot of this is learning new stuff and unlearning things that we don't want to keep. Uncover associations and stereotypes that you hold, but to do that, you got to notice the difference. So we got to let go of that ideal of colorblindness. And be mindful that you carry uh, associations and stereotypes with you always. It's like a lens in front of our eyes. And with a lot of work and a lot of uh, self-reflection and just ongoing um, self-work, you can become more and more aware of that lens and, and get good at uh, seeing through it. Expose your implicit associations. I will, Rana, I will answer your question in just a minute. There are 
implicit association tests that you can take. And I encourage you to check those out, but only if you truly understand what they are uh, examining. Um, because without that, it can be easy to dismiss kind of what, you, what you find. I do offer a program called Implicit Associations, Insidious Assumptions, uh, Unintended Manifestations of Bias in Everyday Life. Uh, I don't know when I'm offering that again. I, I recently offered it, but it is, um, it is something that I do have in my, in my um, dossier of programs. But you can check those out. There's a very uh, informative FAQ on that site that teaches you everything you need to know, a very straightforward way about IATs. You can also check out the free online training modules from the Kerwin Institute on implicit bias. I have some recommended readings. Uh, Blind Spot is a very fun, uh, I felt like a fun read, easy read uh, that addresses implicit bias. Biased is another book on that. Is a wonderful uh, resource. Is everyone really equal? Uh, it's kind of a, a social justice primer. It's not just for educators. It really is a good treatment of all of the major social justice uh, topics. So if you're if you're desiring to get your feet wet, but really want to get kind of a general feel of the of the land, I recommend this book by uh, Sensoy and D'Angelo. D'Angelo, by the way, Robin D'Angelo is the author of, of the very popular and, and rightly so book called White Fragility. Whistling Vivaldi is a book that talks about stereotypes and stereotype threat. There's so many wonderful resources out there right now. Here are a couple more. Uh, Beverly Tatum's Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria and Other Conversations About Race. This is a, I, I find, I'm finding it to be uh, a, a delightful read, uh, very, enlightening and, and actually in CFAES, I'm one of the facilitators leading a book club and we're reading a chapter a month for the entire year of 2021. And then that's an idea for you. If you have colleagues or friends that uh, want to get engaged, start a book club. 35 Dumb Things Well-Intended People Say is a book about microaggressions, very uh, quick read, very helpful. And here are my upcoming webinars. I will Pop this link into chat. And don't forget, I have a survey I want you to complete here. All right, give you a couple of links here. So I offer monthly webinars uh, about inclusive excellence in hiring. The next one is next week. And then I also have a rotation of programs that I offer on a monthly basis, and I've listed them here. I have one that's separate, uh, specific to microaggressions happening also next week. I have one on identity, power, and privilege. I have a bystander intervention program. So if you, uh, it's, a, it's a nice follow-up to the microaggressions workshop because it teaches you how to, um, to stand up when you witness a microaggression. And then I have uh, one that's a basic introduction to queer identities called Queer 101. And then in June, I have uh, also one that's specific to uh, gender diversity, uh, gender demystified. And uh, this is um, near and dear to my heart as a transgender person. And, and I love uh, getting people to explore this topic in a way that they've not done so in the past. Kind of, And you'll have an opportunity to explore your own affectional um, and sexual and gender uh, orientations, as well as gender identity, and really kind of parse out how all those things are different, but interact in really nuanced ways. So, uh, and it's, it's somewhat biographical, autobiographical as well. I incorporate my personal journey as a way to illustrate the concepts. So it's a really fun program. I've been giving this one for over, geez, over 15 years, and, uh, and I really love it. So I hope you'll consider joining me for that one. And then finally, I have a um, feedback survey for you to complete for me. Oh, I also want to mention that CFAES has a new diversity, equity, and inclusion newsletter. 
And we promote not only my programs, but other programs that are open to people in CFAES as well as the, the university. Feel free to sign up for that. Uh, it comes out once a month, so you will not be bombarded with uh, emails from us. I'm going to stop share here for a second so that I can grab that, that Qualtrics code or URL. So here is the link to my survey. And again, please, please, please take some time. It should only take you five minutes to complete that survey. I do consider it a form of activism because it does help impact the experience of people who come after you attending my programs. So I do thank you so much for your attention. Thank you for joining me this afternoon. Thank you for staying an extra half an hour. I was a little too ambitious, but I, I've been off work for two weeks. I was recovering from surgery and I guess I just got a little too carried away at times. Um, so I hope that you found this inspiring. I don't have to be anywhere right away. So if, lunch can stop. If you have a question or you wanted to contribute a comment, uh, feel free to put it in the chat or uh, unmute yourself and speak up. Be happy to hear from you and can stick around for a few minutes and, uh, and talk about, about anything you'd like to, to bring to the table. If you're out, if you're heading out, thank you so much. Have a great day.